G'day, my name's Wally Notman. Today we're standing on Mount McDonnell on the southern edge of Turongo Plateau, not too far from the Borbor Plateau as you can see behind me. We're exploring the reforestation of Turongo Plateau, carried out in the late 1980s and early 1990s. We're fortunate to have two forest scientists today who worked on the project to give us a first-hand account of how the project was conducted and look at some of the outcomes 30 to 40 years down the track. After the 2019-20 bushfires, about 12,500 hectares of fire kill ash eucalypt forest was re sown under what we call the Forest Restoration Project. Why re sow, you may ask? Doesn't it just grow back? Well, the answer is not necessarily. Firstly, when ash eucalypts are burned at high intensity, they're generally killed outright and don't re sprout from the base or stem like other eucalypts. And many years of experience in science tell us that if ash forest is killed at less than 15 to 20 years of age, its chances of recovery are low as it just doesn't produce enough seed to grow a new forest. The legacy of the 2003 and the 2006-07 bushfires is that huge areas of ash forest in the eastern highlands of Victoria were in that vulnerable age class leading into the fires. Turn the clock back to the first half of the 20th century and a series of devastating bushfires in 1926, 1932 and ultimately in 1939 resulted in a similar outcome for some areas of ash forest in the central and eastern highlands. One such area was Turongo Plateau where we are today. Many people would be familiar with Turongo Falls. In fact, 100,000 people visit it per year now. But not so many people know or have visited Turongo Plateau. The impacts of those earlier fires here left a particularly stark but intriguing landscape in their wake, described by renowned botanist J.H. Willis from a trip in October 1944 as thus. What had been a virgin forest, glorious beech groves or mossy alpine gardens of surpassing beauty were transformed in a manner of minutes into a hellish inferno, then left a hideous, dreary waste that can never hope to recapture the pristine charm. Some of the remaining mature forest that was burnt on Taronga was thought to have reached 250 years of age. Just a few months after the 1939 fires while expecting the damage, the Inspector of Forests in the company of the Forest Commission Chairman measured a blown over fire killed ash on Taronga at over 100 metres, taller than any current living eucalypt. In 2020, we were able to respond and re -sow large areas relatively quickly onto a viable post-fire seed bed, thanks to aircraft and a reasonable amount of seed having been collected and stored. But in 1939, as well as coming to grips with the disaster of the fires through the Stretton Royal Commission, Australia had entered World War II, and at home the focus of society and industry was on fueling production of all things required in wartime. The Forest Commission, while undertaking a massive timber salvage operation in the mature fire-killed ash, also understood the vulnerability of the young ash forests and estimated that nearly 30,000 hectares in the central highlands was unlikely to regenerate. Efforts to chip away at this started, and in the intervening years, forest managers grappled earnestly trying to recover this forest with an array of reforestation techniques. Tarongo Plateau proved particularly difficult, but substantial funding to re-establish forest cover here arrived in the mid to late 1980s. Well, my name is Peter Fagg. I'm a forester of uh, many years. I've largely retired now, but at the time this project was set up, Wally, I was had a statewide responsibility for uh, silviculture work, uh, which included reforestation, reseeding, replanting, that sort of work. My name's Owen Salkin. Uh, I'm a fire behaviour analyst and modeller, uh, previously with uh, DELP and all its predecessors. Uh, I've worked in uh, forestry, uh, reforestation, uh, fire analysis, and that sort of thing. Um, I first started working on the Tarongo Plateau in 1987 as part of a project, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Peter, what was yeah. your first impression of what you saw here? Well, well, when I first came here, the area was uh, a mixture of patches of forest, remnant forest, but largely unforested, grassy, uh, plateau country. What was your understanding of what led to that? My understanding is there were uh, repeated wildfires, perhaps starting back as early as the 1870s with uh, 
gold miners travelling from Woods Point to the Tangible Diggings, burning the bush so it made walking easier. Then catastrophic fires in 1926, 1932, 1939. Mm. Basically the, the uh, repeated wildfires that occurred in such a short period of time didn't let the eucalypts re put seed on again and that led to uh, no eucalypts regenerating because the seed needs to come from the canopy. Amazing coming back here isn't it Peter just looking at this stuff I mean when I first came here it was just a, a plot with a fence around it grass and around here just bare grassland with the open grown beaches in there and now you look at it it's amazing. Truly is Owen those trees are now what we think they're about 35 or so years old and they're they're large they're growing healthily even the understory is coming back the bushes the, the even the even the, all the animals, were, I guess, were coming in there as well. So we're, we're recreating what it was years ago, many yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. so we're in this stand of uh, alpine ash that's been planted in about 1974. And we've got about 2,000 trees per hectare that were planted. And what's starting to happen now is it's 40 years old is some of the trees are starting to die and it's thinning itself out. So by the time it gets to around 200 years, you might only have about 100 trees per hectare. And this is kind of the natural process, long-term thing that happens in these forests. Remembering this was, you know, grassland prior to about 1970, what we now got is uh, Myrtle Beach seedlings, which have been windborne seed from the adjacent Myrtle Beach. And this is starting to establish in the area. We've got lyrebird scratchings here. So we've got things that are nearly functioning as a natural ecosystem. So what would have the specified silvicultural objective been in the 1980s? Well, it's to turn it from a, a grassland area into a saw log producing area and to establish trees that in 50 to 80 years time will um, produce high quality saw logs uh, that can be kiln dried and turned into furniture products and high quality timber products. So in a sense, I guess it fostered forest regeneration even more broadly than that, didn't it? Yeah, well, now that, you know, the times have changed and we're actually thinking of seeing native forests as a store of carbon uh, and a uh, place for biodiversity and protected species, um, we've actually created something that future generations can make a decision about how they want to manage it. Yep. Um, and that's the wonderful thing about coming up here. Yep. So what determined species selection up here? Was it driven by what was thought to be here before the fires? Or was it driven by what could establish successfully, or was it a common, or was that the same thing? Well, there was uh, the, the main species that were up here were trialled in uh, 1972 experiments that we saw before, uh, but two of them uh, were dropped out because of they too frost sensitive. That's a mountain ash and the blue gum. Uh, that was left. We were left with the shining gum and the alpine ash. Uh, which have both uh, been planted here widely and have done quite well. And we expect those species were present across the plateau before the fires? Yes, they were because there were some remnant trees, I believe, Owen. Uh, yeah. You found, you got seed off them, in fact. Yeah, we, there's a Tarongo provenance of uh, Eucalyptus nitens and we collected seed off that and raised it as seedlings to plant back here. Um, and we were running around identifying where the mountain ash would start. On the lower elevations, we would have put mountain ash. On the higher elevations, we would have put alpine ash. Okay. By, and we would have determined that by what remnant trees were here. Yep. So I'm assuming frost would have been a, a very severe up on the plateau here, especially in an open grassland scenario as existed across this particular site. Yeah, in, in 1983, there were 30 frosts in a row in October and November. That's how severe it is. And even the shining gum was failing. So okay. there's still a bit of luck uh, in, in being able to establish uh, the trees. You need the right conditions. And in 1988, we certainly got them. We didn't have any frosts and we had really good conducive conditions to establishing the forest that we're standing in now. So speaking of establishment, given this was a grassy area, did that determine what sort of establishment techniques you used? 
Yes, it did. Okay. In terms of we, we ploughed the site with a, with a mound plough that got rid of the grass and then we planted in it. If you'd tried to just sow seed, the grass would have outcompeted it and we wouldn't have had any, any success. Okay. So it was ploughing and then planting trees in there. Any and issues with, with browsing? Or? With some uh, ver vermin control at, uh, to, to keep out rabbits, I believe? Yeah, there was, there was a big issue with rabbits in the 1970 plots and they had to fence them to be able to establish them. Okay. And in one case that's no English related to me, there was one rabbit inside the fence that ate all the trees and they had to start again. Okay. <laughs> this is a Nothophagus Cunningham eye, or otherwise known as Myrtle Beach. It's a rainforest tree from Victoria, it's a Gondwanan relic. And what this tree here has done is it's been killed in the 1939 fires. Well, not actually killed, but the top of it's been killed, but the base of it has shot back from epicormic shoots and we see these multiple leaders. And this thing is now, uh, what have we got, 80 years old? And it's starting to produce seed. And because the microclimate's been changed by bringing in the, the eucalypts, planting them, we've, we've established a microclimate, we've got rid of the grass and it's able to seed and start growing back the Myrtle Beach Forest as an understory in these eucalypts. It, this is a Myrtle Beach seedling that's resulted from this main big tree over here and it's about three years old. This one here probably about ten years old. So while well, what we're looking at here is we've got reforestation on this side and what was here before the reforestation which is the montane wattle and over here we've got sown uh, shining gum and alpine ash. So what's the origin of the wattle? When do you think that originated or established like it is? Well that's come back after the 39 fires and it's come back as thick as hairs on a dog's back um, and then that was uh, bulldozed and burnt and then the eucalypt sown and in terms of a carbon sink that will probably only ever have you know 200 tonnes above the ground and this can have a, th a thousand tonnes per hectare above the ground. So it appears the forest types on either side of the road on a pretty different trajectory, Alan. What do you think they'll look like in about 50 years' time? This stuff will probably be still a mixture of montane wattle and rainforest, and this will be a mixture of rainforest, understory, and uh, mature shining gum with hollows developing for animals to live in. Okay. So a little bit more well-developed vertical structure on the left? Yeah, yep. yeah. So Peter, we're in a major gully system here. I assume not all, every square inch of the plateau was reforested. There were certain areas set aside, is that right? Yes, the rainforest areas and all gully areas were protected. They weren't bulldozed, they weren't cleared. Uh, the area that was planted uh, only came down to perhaps 30 or 50 metres away from any, any gully. That was to protect the soil, protect the water, and protect the biodiversity in the gully. Okay. The life of that reforestation project, or what was the life of it, and how much mm. area was treated in this sort of locality? There was about 3,000 hectares treated, reforested, by planting or direct seeding, uh, and that was out of a total of about 10,000 hectares. Okay. Uh, so there is area still to be done if that's required or we have the funds. Um, also that should mention that area was done over a period of about 12 or 13 years. What's the background of this side Owen? Well we're actually standing on Cone Hill which is an extinct volcano, thank goodness it's extinct. Uh, and basically what happened in 1990 is they had a big stand of uh, senescent silver wattle, in other words it was dying and the, ca the crowns were falling apart and we've bulldozed it over and we've sown back Mount Nash. And what you can see coming back around you now, which is now 30 years old, is a stand of Mount Nash with a silver wattle understory uh, and lots of understory species and ferns and things like that. Um, so looking up th there through the light, is that where the other wattle, the dead wattle stand is? is that yeah, the light? And, mm -hmm. and basically when we started in 1990, the wattle would have been about uh, 50 years old and mm -hmm. then over the next 20 years it's degraded further until around about 2010 it all fell over 
and now all that's there is uh, tree ferns and musk daisy bush okay. and wattle logs lying all over the place. Okay, so it's a, a very short forest if you could call it a forest. Yeah, but it's it's part, it's a natural ecosystem, and yeah. and what would happen in these gaps that don't have eucalypts on them is the understory species would become the dominant species, okay. and in this case, it's the musk daisy bush. Yep. And look, I'd like to thank you both for coming out today. It's been mm. a treat having you both out here, sharing with us your experience and wisdom as forest scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wally. Thank you, everyone. A pleasure. Thanks very much. So folks, we've really just scratched the surface on one aspect of the story of Taronga Plateau. We'd also like to know if your own experience is up here. Were you involved in the reforestation project or any experience you've got on Taronga Plateau at all? Thanks for joining us.